A particle of mass m falls from rest under gravity. There is an air resistance of magnitude mkv where k is a positive constant and v is the speed of the particle at any moment. Show that as time passes indefinitely, the speed of the particle approaches a terminal velocity of g over k. Before we do any calculations, let's uh, look at a picture of what's going on. At t equals naught, the particle is at rest, so its speed is zero. Okay, the particle is dropped from rest. What are the forces acting on the particle? Well, we are assuming that the particle is dropped near the Earth's surface, so its weight is given by mg. We need to bring in a resistance force here. Unlike other problems, um, we need to consider air resistance here. And that acts in a direction that's opposing the motion of the particle, vertically up. So in general, this resistance force has a magnitude mkv. So the magnitude depends on the speed, but you can see that initially when the particle is dropped from rest, v is zero. So the magnitude is, is zero, m times k times zero. So we don't at t equals zero, we have no resistance force at just this instant. Now, we know that as the particle falls, of course, um, its speed will increase, even with air resistance. If the speed is zero initially, it will pick up speed. And let's suppose that at some time later, the speed is v. Now what's the resistance force? Well, it opposes the motion of the particle. Its magnitude is m times k times v. So the resistance force is growing as the particle's speed v increases. So the resistance force, which we will call r, is proportional to the speed of the particle. r is proportional to v. You can see that clearly from this equation. r is just a constant times v. So that means that if we double the speed v, we double the resistance force. If we triple v, we triple the resistance force, and so on. By the way, we know that this quantity is a magnitude because m is a positive quantity. k we are given is a positive constant, so k never changes. Um, v is the speed. We know speed is the magnitude of the velocity. That's always positive. It's the magnitude of a vector. So r is refers to the magnitude of the resistance force. Now, as v increases, mkv will approach the weight of the particle. Alright, so there will come a time when the resistance force will equal mg. Well, this is what we will prove, actually. Um, you can see, by the way, from this equation that if the resistance force becomes equal in magnitude to the weight of the particle, then k equals g over v. Well, or v equals g over k. So the speed at which this happens is called the terminal velocity. It's called the terminal velocity or final velocity because the speed does not increase any more than this. So the speed will increase from zero up to some maximum. And this maximum is called the terminal velocity. And, and the particle will fall towards the Earth with that constant velocity v max. So the particle will stop accelerating at the point when its velocity becomes terminal. This happens when there's air resistance. If there's no air resistance, of course, the particle will just keep on accelerating towards the ground. Its speed will keep on increasing. So what we need to do is get the speed of the particle v as a function of time. To do that, we will consider the acceleration of the particle. How do we get the acceleration of the particle? Well, we apply Newton's second law. The magnitude of the resultant force on the particle is the mass of the particle times the magnitude of the acceleration of the particle. So we are dealing with vectors in one dimension, so um, we will take the downwards direction as positive. You don't have to, but it's uh, probably more convenient here. This will be the direction of the resultant force. Um, well, we could consider a vector equation, um, you know, take the force mg, which is positive, and this force here will be negative. So we have the vector sum of the forces acting on the particle. 
but we kind of know that MG is always going to be greater than MKV. You know, MKV starts out at zero and it, it grows in magnitude until it reaches MG. So, you know, this this thing here will come out to be positive, this quantity. So we could just disregard this vector equation and just talk about the magnitude of F because we know that this will always be positive. So how do we get the acceleration? Well, we just divide across by M. Now, we're interested in V as a function of time. So what we do is we write the acceleration as the derivative of V with respect to T. So here is our separable differential equation. We can separate this, we can bring everything involving V to one side and everything involving T to the other side. Okay, so um, divide both sides by G minus KV and multiply both sides by DT. So this is equivalent to multiplying both sides of this equation by DT over G minus KV. So if you do that, you will separate the variables. Remember, g is a constant, k is a constant, so all the v's are now on one side and the t's are on the other side. Next step is to integrate both sides, as we've seen before. So we are looking for v as a function of t, so we want to see how v will change with time, and hopefully v will reach some maximum value. That's assuming, of course, that the particle doesn't strike the ground in the meantime. So we are assuming that the particle has dropped from uh, a sufficiently high point so the particle will reach some maximum velocity before it strikes the ground. So that's what we're going to try and see from the formula for V, all right? We're going to see what happens when we make T very large. Does our formula approach some limiting value? That limiting value will be called the terminal velocity, and hopefully we will see that as G over K. Okay, so let's look at this integral here. Now, um, notice that the denominator is linear in V, so that suggests that its integral will involve ln of the denominator, okay? Uh, you know, the integral of 1 over V with respect to V is ln of V, so V is linear in the denominator, V to the 1, and that's exactly what we have here. We have a, um, an expression that's linear in V, it's got V to the power of 1, the G and the K are just constants. Now this is not the full story, um, you see, if you differentiate this with respect to V, well, you have to put 1 over the denominator. That's when you differentiate ln of something. And then you have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside the bracket, which is minus k. So you're not going to get 1 over g minus kv. You'll get minus k over g minus kv. So what you need to do is, to get rid of this minus k, is write minus 1 over k in front of this. All right, so you put 1 over the coefficient of V, basically, 1 over minus k. And uh, you see then you will get 1 over g minus kv. That's what you want here. Of course, you could also use a substitution method to evaluate this integral. You could let u equal g minus kv and, and work with that, and you'll end up getting this result. Okay, so that's the left-hand side. We get a constant, of course, we bring it over and combine it with the constant on the right-hand side. Integrating 1 with respect to time gives us time, gives us t. Integrate 1, we get 1t, and we have our arbitrary constant c on the right hand side. Now, before we make v the subject of this, so we will have our function v, um, we'll have v as a function of t, let's get c. It's easier to find the arbitrary constant when it's in this form. Um, right, so what's the initial condition here, or the boundary condition? We see that when t is not, v is not. So if you plug naught in for t, we must get naught for v. Okay, so we get g minus naught here, which is g, and we get uh, naught plus c, which is c. So we have we have found c. So here's our general solution, and now we can write down our... So we just copy out the general solution. Replacing c with minus 1 over k ln of g. Now we want to isolate v, get v as a function of t. Um, so we can start by multiplying both sides by minus k. Minus k times this term here will give us plus ln of g. I'll write this term first, minus kt. Okay, next we want to get g minus kv. 
Well, to do that, we raise e to the power of ln of g minus kv. And we must raise e to the power of the right-hand side. OK, so we can factorize this like this. And uh, e to the power of ln of g is just g. Next, we subtract g from both sides. So we're going to get a minus g here. And then we divide by minus k. So we'll have minus g over minus k, which is plus g over k. And we divide mi minus g e to the minus kt by, um, well, sorry, g e to the minus kt by minus k to get this term here. So I've subtracted g from both sides here and divided both sides by minus k. So at last, we have found v as a function of time. The g, g and k are constants, of course. If you want, you can factorize g over k out of this. Um, now we can see what's going to happen as t increases indefinitely. Intuitively, we suspect that as t increases indefinitely, the particle will reach some terminal velocity when the weight is equal to the resistance force, as we saw earlier. OK, just as a reminder, at some time weight will equal the resistance force. Now this kind of makes sense because there's nothing actively pushing up on this particle. Um, so the resistance force reaches some maximum. That maximum will be the weight of the particle. Okay, the resistance p can't keep on increasing, you know, there's nothing actively pushing up on it to keep on. It's not, it can't just increase indefinitely. So we can analyze from this formula what happens as t keeps on increasing. e to the minus kt is just 1 over e to the power of k times t, where k is a positive constant. So as t increases, you can see what's going to happen. The denominator will increase. So the entire thing will, will approach 0. As the denominator blows up, the fraction will approach 0. So we write it like this. As t approaches infinity, e to the minus kt is going to approach zero. So for very large times, this quantity will be very small. It will be practically zero. Um, so we can see that this thing here is heading towards zero as time goes on, which means that the velocity v is approaching g over k times 1, which is g over k. This is the, this is the terminal velocity. So we see that v is always less than g over k. Because, you see, inside the brackets here, we have a number that's less than 1. All right? So we have g over k times a number that's less than 1. It's, it's less by this amount here. So as time goes on, this quantity here is approaching 0, and v is getting larger and larger. It's less than g over k, but it's approaching this value here. So this is the final or terminal speed of the particle. So if we go back up to the picture, the maximum value is k over g. Um, I'm sorry, it's g over k. So the resistance force is m times k times v, remember, where v in this case is going to be g over k. So you can see here that the maximum resistance force is equal to the weight of the particle. Now the next part we want to find an expression for the distance travelled in t seconds. So we have the speed v as a function of time. The speed v is the derivative of the distance s with respect to time. Well you can call s y or x or whatever you like. So we need to solve this differential equation. Now this differential equation is separable. Uh, just multiply both sides by dt. See, we just have s on the left-hand side, and we just have t on the right-hand side. g and k are constants. So we're going to get s as a function of time. So if we integrate 1 with respect to s, we just get s. We have our arbitrary constant from this integral, of course, but that's brought over and joined with the arbitrary constant from the integral on the right-hand side. Now, g over k is just a constant. We can pull that out. We need to integrate 1 with respect to time. Well, that's just going to give us time. That's going to give us t. 
Next, we need to integrate minus e to the minus kt with respect to time. So, you know, you could look this up. The integral of e to the at with respect to time is 1 over a times e to the at. Okay, that just comes from the chain rule. Or if, you know, if you differentiate e to the at with respect to time, you get a e to the at, and the a will cancel with 1 over a. Or you can use a substitution, you know, you could let u equal at and do it that way, whatever. Um, I prefer to think of differentiating this thing here to check that you get e to the at. All right, so the a here, by the way, is a constant. It stands for a constant. It's not the acceleration. It's just a general function e to the power of a constant times t, because that's the kind of function we're dealing with here, e to the power of a constant times t, where the constant is minus k. So um, you can see we need to put 1 over that constant, so we're going to have minus... Um, 1 over minus k e to the minus kt and uh, we have our constant of integration which I will call c of course we get a plus sign here now we apply our boundary condition um, so the distance that the particle has traveled when it's dropped from rest is 0 of course s is equal to 0 so S stands for the distance it has traveled. So when when t is 0, S is 0. So we put S equal to 0 when t is 0. We get e to the power of 0, which is 1. Okay, so we get g over k squared and bring that over. So C is minus g over k squared. So we copy out our general solution, replacing c with the value that we got to get our particular solution for this problem. Alright, so by the way, we could factor, um, we could take this minus g over k squared inside this bracket here. And remember we want minus g over k squared, so we need to put a 1 on top to get minus g and put a k underneath. So g over k times minus 1 over k will give us the minus g over k squared. This is probably a bit neater looking. Now, as an aside, notice that as t gets very large, e to the minus kt is going to approach 0. So what's s going to approach? Um, s will approach a linear function of time. OK, uh, this will go out. This will, e to the minus kt will go to 0, so this term will vanish. Okay, for large times, s is approaching a linear function of t. And if distance is a linear function of time, it means that the speed is um, constant. And you can see that ds dt, which is v, of course, is going to approach, well, if we differentiate this with respect to time, we get g over k. See here, we just have g over k, k times t. If we differentiate that with respect to time, we get g over k. And then we just have a constant, g over k times minus 1 over k. Well, that's just a number, so that's going to go to 0. Of course, this is the terminal velocity that we saw on the first part. So everything is making sense here.